Hello, welcome to our lecture on ocean basins. So let's get started. So the study of the seafloor and the act of mapping the seafloor is known as bathymetry. And as long as people have been sailing the ocean, they've been wondering how deep the ocean is and what the bottom of the seafloor looks like. So some of the earliest studies to measure the depth of the seafloor were pretty rudimentary and included a weighted rope. So a long rope with a weight at the end of it, which sailors would let out over the side of the ship. And what they would do is they would tie knots in this rope. And each knot was a given distance away from the knot in front of it. And so instead of letting out all this rope until it hit the seafloor, and then measuring how much rope you let out, they would just count the number of knots as they let out the rope and then multiply the number of knots by the length of rope between each knot. This is uh, obviously a pretty inefficient way to measure the depth and of the seafloor and to map the seafloor. And so we've had made progress since that time. And with that progress, we've been able to map um, some uh, a lot of the seafloor in, uh, to a coarse degree, we only have very fine and detailed maps of the C4 for a very small portion of it. So advances in bathymetry include echo soundings, multi-beam systems, and satellite altimetry. I'm going to talk about each one of these starting with echo soundings. So echo sounds are uh, employ sound. So a ship will emit a sound wave that travels that travels down to the seafloor and then it bounces off the seafloor and travels back up to the ship. And they record the amount of time it takes for the sound to travel down and travel back up. And that time is T, right here, T. And that time is known as the two-way travel time. Because that's the time it takes to travel two ways down and then back up. And so if they want to measure the time it took for the sound wave just to travel down to the sea floor, they take that two-way travel time and divide it by two. And so once you know the time it took to travel one way, and if you multiply that by the speed at which the sound wave travels, you can get the distance that the sound wave traveled, which is the depth of the sea at that point. Now the biggest uh, source of error in this is the speed of sound of the water. Since the speed of sound of water is dependent on both the proportional to both the, sorry, <laughs> it's hard to draw this pen, proportional to both the salinity and the temperature and both the salinity and the temperature, they vary with depth. And so you have to send out a sensor that measures the salinity and temperature at various depths and sends that information back to the ship where the computer calculates the speed of sound at the different depths, which they can use to calculate the, uh, an accurate depth. Without a, an accurate uh, speed of sound profile, uh, it's hard to get, it's, it's almost impossible to get accurate depth. So an advancement on echo sounds, uh, because even with echo sounds, you're still only measuring the depth at one point of the seafloor, the point where the sound wave bounces off the seafloor. But the advantage is, is that you can make measurements very rapidly. But advancement of this is uh, multi-beam systems, which is the combination of many echo sounders. And so instead of just sounding, sending one sound wave down and for it to bounce back up, he sends many sound waves down in different directions. They travel down and, and bounce off the seafloor back up to the ship. And so instead of, able, instead of measuring the depth of a point beneath the ship, we measure the depth along a line under the ship. And so as the ship moves forward, uh, we can measure the depth of a path or a swath. And so if we want to map the uh, particular area of the seafloor. A ship with a multi-beam system can go on a cruise 
and it can sail around that area back and forth in what's called mowing the lawn and map that part of the seafloor. And having multiple multi-beam uh, measurements, it can help reduce the uncertainties in the measurements, um, having multiple echosounders rather than just one. And finally, we use satellite altimetry as a means of mapping the seafloor. Uh, in satellite altimetry, the satellite uses radio waves to map the sea surface. Now, you may be wondering, why would you map the sea surface if you want to map the sea floor? Well, it's because the sea surface mirrors the sea floor. Because topography on the sea floor, or bathymetry of the sea floor, sorry, um, represents variations in gravity. So, for example, this, this submarine volcano right here, it has a lot of mass, and that mass pulls water towards it due to the law of gravity. And as a result, the water mounds on top of it. And it, say if you had a trench or something, you would have a lack of mass, and so as a result, you would have a depression in the sea surface. And so with satellite altimetry, we use radio waves to map the sea surface, and then we can uh, uh, we can convert that sea, a map of the sea surface to the map of the sea floor. Now, satellite altimetry is, is much more efficient than using multi-beam systems because you don't physically have to go out on a ship into the ocean to measure the sea floor. And uh, we can measure, we have access to a lot more of the ocean with a ship because the satellite uh, can see, see a lot more of Earth than uh, a ship can. So here's uh, two swaths of seafloor mapped by uh, satellite, uh, satellite altimetry. That's the bottom here. And the multi-beam system is the top here. And you can see that uh, we have much more precision, higher resolution with the satellite altimetry than we do the multi-beam system. Now the, the bathymetry of the seafloor can be can vary fairly dramatically, just like the elevation in the continents can. So, for example, if we look at how the elevation varies uh, across the North American continent, from point A to point B along its profile, we see the significant amount of variation. We go from the coast to the Sierra Nevadas, the Rocky Mountains, the Great Plains, and the Appalachian Mountains and the coast. And we can see a lot of variation along the sea floor too. If we look along this profile from C to D. We leave the South American continent, we go to the ocean floor, we see this big structure right here. That is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, running down through the center of the Atlantic Ocean Basin. And we go back up to the African continent. So there is a lot going on along the sea floor. It's not a flat surface. There is uh, a lot of different features to be discovered. This map shows us how much Earth's surface is at different elevations. Sorry, this map, this figure shows us how much of Earth's surface is at different elevations or bathymetric depths. So here is depth in kilometers. So positive is kilometers above sea level and negative is kilometers below sea level. And this is millions of square miles along the x-axis. Okay, so we have 500 million square mile uh, uh, surface area on Earth. And this is the percentage of the area on Earth. So you can see the how how long the line is at any given depth represents how much percentage of the Earth is at that elevation depth. For example, you see this elevation right here right here makes up about maybe twenty percent of Earth's surface. Where say depths ranging from here to here make up 20, almost 30 percent of Earth's surface. And you can see the ocean as a whole makes up, you know, so if this is, if this is 30, it makes up pretty much almost 70 percent Earth's surface. And we know that because Earth's surface is 71 percent water. Okay. We could have the extremes, so this is Mount Everest, the highest point in elevation on Earth, and this is the lowest point in the ocean, the Mariana's Trench. 
And you see this is the average depth of the ocean, which is about 3,800 meters. And this is the average elevation on the continents, 840 meters. And so the average depth of the ocean is about four and a half times greater than the average elevation of the continents. So the first feature of ocean basins that we're going to talk about are the continental margins. And continental margins are the submerged edges of continents. And here you can see a, a figure showing continental margins. Um, and so this is the, the continental lithosphere, and this portion of the continent that is submerged is known as the continental margin. You can see here this shallow water. So remember the shade of blue represents the depth of the water. The darker the blue, the deeper the water, the lighter the blue, sh the shallower the water. And this area, this light blue, this is the submerged edge of the continent. Okay, it actually extend, extends a little bit further. I should extends out to about right here. This is the continental margin of North America, and you know this is continental margin over here too. All right, and so continental margin has several parts. We have the continental shelf. That is the shallow submerged edge of the continent, uh, the continental slope. This is the transition between the shelf and the deep sea floor. So this is like the the uh, the side of the continent. So if we have a, if I draw a profile of a continental margin, we have the shelf, and then we have the slope that goes down to the deep sea floor. So this steep edge that's the slope, and this is the shelf. Then we have the shelf break. This is the transition between the shelf and the slope. So this point here, that's the shelf break. Then the continental rise is the sediments that accumulate on the continental slope. So all these sediments that cu accumulate on the edge of the continent, those are known as the continental rise. So here we can look at those features. Here's the shelf, the, the top of the submerged edge of the continent. And then we have the slope, the edge of the continent. And the transition between the shelf and the slope, basically the corner of the continent, that's the shelf break. And then we have the continental rise, the piling of the sediment on the slope. And so these three parts, the shelf, the slope, the break, and the rise, they make up the continental margin. Now there's two types of continental margins. There's these very broad margins that are known as passive margins. These very small and narrow ones known as active margins. And the reason why passive margins are broad and active margins are wide is because passive margins are those that are not along an active plate boundary. So there's no plate boundary between the continental lithosphere and the oceanic lithosphere. However, with an active plate margin, uh, there is an active plate boundary. So you see this oceanic lithosphere that's, sub that's subducting here is not the same as this lithosphere here. They're not continuous. So this active plate boundary, which is always a convergent plate boundary in which subduction occurs, causes deformation of the continent and which cr uh, crumples it up and that results in a very narrow continental margin. So you see that you just have this little tiny little tiny continental shelf here. It's a little part, and here's the slope. Just a little tiny shelf, where here you have this nice, big, broad shelf. Okay, so let's take a look at Google Maps. Okay. And we can see, we looked here, this is the east coast of North America. So this is the, the a passive margin because it's nice and broad. If we go down to South America, we can see another passive margin along the east coast. That means there's no plate boundary here. And another path, and so this is all passive margin along the east coast and this broad shelf. But, but however, on the west coast of South America, you have a much narrower uh, 
margin because it's an active margin. So there's a subduction zone here. You can see this is the uh, the trench of the subduction zone. So the oceanic lithosphere of the Nazca plate is subducting under the continental lithosphere of South American plate. And that convergence causes deformation in the continental crust and produces this very narrow shelf, and this very narrow margin. Now if we plot the plate boundaries, you can see that yes, there is a plate boundary on the west coast of South America, and there is not one on the east coast of South America. Okay, so that, those are active and passive uh, continental margins. So the figures we've been looking at have had the vertical scale dr uh, drastically exaggerated. So here we have depth in kilometers ranging from 0 to 5 kilometers. But if you see, the x-axis is distance from shore in kilometers, but it's in units of 100 kilometers. Okay. So where we have a change in depth of 5 kilometers throughout the continental, well, it's kind of maybe 4 kilometers uh, from the coast to the edge of the continental margin, that occurs over a distance of uh, maybe 800 kilometers. So that's you know a 200 time uh, difference between the vertical and horizontal uh, axes. So the uh, these figures they make these features look very pronounced, but they're much more subtle than what they see in these figures. And if we look down here, we have a, a graph where the vertical scale is uh, the same as the horizontal scale. You can see how these uh, features are still present but not as pronounced. So here is the shelf, and then here is where that slope transitions. It goes from a shallow to a steeper slope. Um, so that's the shelf, that's the break, here's the slope, and then here's the rise, the sediments accumulate on it. So we can still see those features, it's just harder to see them whenever we don't exaggerate the vertical scale. So along the edges of continental margins, there are these currents, called turbidity currents, flow along the uh, seafloor, along the shelf, and over the s shelf break and down the slope. And these currents, they, they pick up a bunch of sediment, and that makes the currents dense, and so they really want to hug the seafloor. And as they flow over the shelf break and down the slope, they erode into the edge of the uh, continental margin. And over time, they carve these submarine canyons, like you see here. So these submarine canyons are carved by these currents that flow along the sea floor, which are known as turbidity currents. So turbidity currents form these submarine canyons. And we can see some of those submarine canyons along the uh, east, uh, the continental margin, the east coast of North America. There are those submarine canyons right here. And some of them are very large. Uh, some of them are actually so large that they're wider than the Grand Canyon itself. And we can see those submarine canyons we just looked at. All along here, cut into here as well. You can see these canyons that not only do they cut into the shelf and the slope, but they cut into this the rise here. So you can see this gradual increase in depth. So these are the piled sediments. You can see those canyons cut into the uh, rise as well. And then those turbidity currents, they dump their sediments on the deep sea floor once they flow off of the margin. Okay. So, continental margins are the features of the ocean basins that run along the edges of the basins, obviously. Uh, they are at the edges of the uh, margins of the continents. There's other notable features that run through ocean basins, and those are the mid-ocean ridges. And the mid-ocean ridges, which are illustrated in red here, are the result of divergent plate boundaries along the sea floor. 
And these ridges rise above the deep sea floor, and that's why they're known as ridges. They're sort of like a linear mountain chain running along the sea floor. So here is an illustration of the North Atlantic Ocean Basin with the vertical scale exaggerated. So here is the continental margin as we talked about, the slope, I'm sorry, the shelf that's up here. This edge is the slope, that line that translates to the shelf, uh, shelf break. And then you can see the, the, the sun's piled up on it. But then you have this feature here. This is the mid-ocean ridge. Okay, This is formed by the divergent plate boundary, uh, which is along which new seafloor forms, and it spreads away from that ridge. Okay, And if we go back to Google Earth, you can see that mid-ocean ridge is running through the North Atlantic Ocean Basin. You can see how it's a little bit lighter blue. That means it's shallower than the ocean floor around it. And so there's this ridge running through the sea floor. You can see it runs all through the uh, Atlantic Ocean Basin. And if we map the plate boundaries, you'll see, sure enough, that ridge is a plate boundary. It's a divergent plate boundary. You can see these ridges run all through the ocean. Okay. And it's along these ridges that new seafloor is formed and it spreads away from. And so we have ridges running all through. And now we've got all turned upside down because we're on the planet, so let's reorient ourselves. Okay. So now we're in the Pacific and we have ridges in the Pacific as well. So in between the continental margins and the mid-ocean ridges we have what's known as the abyssal plains. And the abyssal plains are these very flat, vast, sedimented uh, areas of the sea floor, the ocean basin. And uh, they are they cover the majority of Earth's surface because they cover the majority of the ocean. Uh, they are the largest feature of ocean basins. And since they're the largest feature of ocean basins and ocean, the ocean covers 71% of Earth's surface. Most of Earth's surface is abyssal plains. And on those abyssal plains, we have small extinct volcanoes or rock intrusions uh, that form near oceanic ridges. And we call these abyssal hills. So they add small, small scale bathymetry on the abyssal plains. So we look back at this image, we have the margins along the edge of the basin. We have the mid ocean ridge running down through it. And in between the margins and the mid ocean ridge, we have the abyssal plain. Okay, this, this, this large flat area. And on the abyssal plain, we have the abyssal hills. The abyssal hills protruding up. Now all these abyssal hills are extinct volcanoes that used to be active whenever this sea, excuse me, this sea floor was closer to the mid-ocean ridge. And as this sea floor spread away, the volcanoes went extinct. So there's no longer active volcanoes. And some of those volcanoes that were active near the ridge, they grew large enough to poke their head above sea level. Whenever that happened, the top of them was eroded, giving them a flat surface. Now these, ex these abyssal hills that have a flat top, they're known as guyots. So these guyots uh, are extinct volcanoes that at one point in time reached the sea surface and weathering and erosion flattened their top. While these other features that have a rounded surface, they're known as sea mounts. They are extinct volcanoes that never reach the surface and so have retained their rounded top. So of these abyssal hills, we have guyots, ones with flat tops that reach the sea surface and weathering and erosion, flatten their top, and we have seamounts. Those are those are abyssal hills that, that never reach the surface and retain their rounded top. So here we can see those abyssal hills. Uh, from this image, it's hard to see if they have flat or rounded tops, but the ones with rounded tops are seamounts. The ones with flat tops are abyssal hills.
I don't know if we can maybe see with enough resolution here on Google Earth. Now uh, this one might look like it's a little bit flat. Maybe that's a guy out where this is a C mount with that rounded top. Another C mount with the rounded top. These are C mounts as well. And let's see. Oh, this one a flat top. And then guy out. Another guy out over here. Okay, so flat tops or guy outs. Oh, here's another flat top. You can see how that one's definitely flat. Um, so those are guy outs. The ones with rounded tops are C mounts. So other features of ocean basins are deep sea trenches. They're drawn in red on this map. In deep sea trenches, they form along subduction zones. Okay, so most subduction occurs along the edge of the Pacific Ocean Basin. That's where most of these trenches exist. But there is a trench in the Indian Ocean Basin, the Java Trench, in the North Atlantic Basin, the Puerto Rico Trench, and the South Atlantic Bas Basin, the South Sandwich Trench. And here is a, um, a map of the uh, Northern Pacific. We have the Pacific Ocean, uh, Pacific Ocean Ecosphere converging with and subducting under this is the North, North American plate. And that subduction results in this oceanic deep sea trench, this dark line. And remember, the volcanism always occurs in the overriding plate. And as a result of that volcanism, we have these volcanic islands forming this volcanic island arc, known as the Aleutian Islands in this case. And those islands continue up here. Uh, and these are islands too, formed by this volcanism, this subduction zone. So usually along these trenches, we can have volcanic island arcs running alongside them. Uh, if the trenches along the continent, we'll have a line of volcanoes along the coast of the continent. Here's the Puerto Rico Trench in the North Atlantic Ocean Basin. Here we have the um, this uh, the ocean lithosphere here, subducting under this lithosphere here. And we have volcanism in the overriding plate. And that volcanism is forming these volcanic island arcs, such as Cuba, Española, and Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and so forth. If we go back to Google Earth, you want to see some deep ocean trenches. Let's you can see the Puerto Rican trench here. This dark blue line coming through there. And then I here see the South Sandwich trench right there, and that's subduction. And you can see the volcanic island arc running along it. These are the South Sandwich Islands. Those islands exist because of the subduction zone. It wasn't the vol wasn't due to the it wasn't due to the volcanism uh, uh, from this uh, subduction, those islands wouldn't exist. Here we have the trench along the west coast of South America. This deep sea trench from this subduction. And we have subduction along Central America here too, from this trench. And the subduction stops. It doesn't pick up again through here, but this is a fairly young subduction zone. It doesn't have too large of a trench. Here's that pollution trench, which we saw a picture of. And we have the volcanic island arcs running along that trench. I, I forgot to mention that there's volcanoes um, all along Central America and South America along those trenches as well. And we have subduction occurring over here. So we also have the trench. You can see um, in the bottom corner here, the elevation, if it's negative, it's below sea level. But you can see how as we move for about, you know, 5,500 uh, 5, meters deep in the abyssal plain. But once we come to the ocean trench, we can see that it gets deeper so if we find it so that right there we're 
7,000 meters deep. So they're, they're pretty narrow, so it's hard to find them exactly. If we come down here, we find the deepest trench, and that is the Marianas Trench. And you can find there we're at uh, 7,500 some meters deep. So that's pretty deep. Okay. And so there's a subduction zone. So here are all these abyssal plains, the vast flat sedimented regions. And then you have the mid ocean ridges. Okay, and so the oceanic, uh, the deep sea trenches, which we just looked at, they're also, they're plate boundaries. That's why you see the yellow lines there, because they're formed by subduction zones. And so then we have the abyssal plains in between, and the abyssal hills and the abyssal plains. So, kind of uh, summarizing our thing, we have uh, the features of ocean basins include the continental margins, the submerged edges of the continents, mid-ocean ridges, these elevated regions that are formed by these elevated linear regions formed by divergent plate boundaries where new ocean lithosphere is formed and spreads away from. In between the margins, kind of the margins and the mid-ocean ridges, we have the abyssal plains, these uh, very vast, flat, sediment-covered areas. Uh, and then Rising from the abyssal plains, we have extinct volcanoes known as abyssal hills. See some right there. And then we have these deep ocean uh, or deep sea trenches that form along subduction zones and the volcanic island arcs that run along them. All right, so finally, here we see a map of Earth. The continents are blacked out, and the, uh, sea, the, the uh, depth of the seafloor or the bathymetry is color coded where the deepest water is dark blue, and as it goes to green, to yellow, and to red, it gets progressively shallower. So red is the shallowest water. So you see these large red areas. These are continental margins. These very thick, broad ones are passive margins, where the narrow ones are active margins. And we see these green lines running through, these elevated regions running through the seafloor. These are the mid-ocean ridges, which are formed by um, divergent plate boundaries. And then in between the margins and the mid-ocean ridges we have these large blue areas. These are the uh, abyssal plains. These blue areas the abyssal plains. Um, and you can see how abyssal plains really do cover a large portion of Earth's surface. Okay. And then we also have um, kind of the opposite of ridges. We have these trenches, which are these very deep linear structures in the ocean basin. Those are formed by subduction. So subduction forms these deep trenches. Most of them are around the edge of the Pacific, as I mentioned. Some in the Atlantic Ocean Basin. There and there. And then you have the volcanic island arcs that run along the uh, deep ocean trenches. And I forgot to mention, on the abyssal plains, you can see this little bit of stuff here. These are the abyssal hills, and those are extinct volcanoes that were active when the seafloor was being formed along the ridge. They've gone extinct as they moved away from the ridge. So that's ocean basins. Uh, there's uh, not too much to them. This is one of the shorter lectures, but uh, ocean basins are very interesting. So we've had most of them mapped to a coarse degree. They're not very uh, detailed. Uh, so we have relatively a lot, a relatively large amount of the ocean to explore in detail. But we do have some parts that we have a very detailed maps of. But for the most part, uh, there is a lot to be explored in the ocean basins. So though this is a short lecture, uh, it might be so short because we still have a lot to learn about ocean basins. So thank you very much.